right after that trombone slide is when I say, uh-huh. good morning, everybody. Welcome <laughs> to TLD Chat. Today is, what is today? Today's Tuesday. We're hanging out today with Cheryl Johnson. And we're going to be talking in just a minute. But before we get to that, we're going to be talking about learning cultures. And so be thinking about that. Be sure to check out the question and answers section just under the screen. If you are new to TLD chat, you can check out what we're going to be talking about in the Q&A. We are the training, learning, and development community chat and conference. We hang out every morning, 8 a.m. Pacific time, 11 a.m. Eastern time, and 4 p.m. UK time. And I'm not exactly sure what time it is in Australia, but I do know it is really, really early, and so we don't normally get many of the Aussies down under uh, hanging out with us. But uh, we do have a lot of fans out there, though, so uh, give them a shout out sometime. Anybody uh, that is interested in a great event coming up, our event, TLDC 18, coming up in January, January 29th and 30th in beautiful, lovely Phoenix, Arizona, be sure to register. We have a limited amount of folks uh, availability, about 100 seats or so we can uh, we can get into the uh, the wonderful and fabulous Geek Chic location of Galvanize. But we are looking forward to having as many of our community members from TLD Chat there as we can possibly get. We also have started a membership. So be sure to take a look at that. I'll tell you more about that at the halfway mark as we get going in today's conversation. But um, I forgot to go over to this piece here and show you all a little bit about the conference. There's a great video from last year's conference. If you want to check out what TLDC 16 was like, you can hit it up. You can also check out the pricing for the event, including a fabulous pre-conference course that we're going to be putting together that Cheryl is going to be putting together for us, which is going to be great. So everything is starting to come together. I've got a few extra uh, special speakers. I think I'm still waiting to get some uh, some uh, confirmations from them. We're very, very, very close to getting it all confirmed. But um, just I don't want to announce just yet until I know for sure that uh, they're going to be able to make it. So uh, lots of exciting stuff on the horizon. Look for it. Sign up for our newsletter and get all excited about TLDC 18 coming up soon. Also, I just want to do one quick shout out for my new company that I work for. Edcast has an event coming up August 23rd and 24th, just a day and a half, but it is packed with some uh, uh, pretty heavy hitting executives and um, expert gurus in the industry. So if uh, if you're in the Silicon Valley area or if you're interested in making the trip out, it always proves to be, this is the third year they've done it, and it always proves to be a fantastic uh, event. Um, all packed in, so it gets to be very, uh, very tight. There's an innovation awards dinner as well, so you get to see um, what some folks are doing in the f- with the future of learning, some uh, some heavy hitting Fortune 500 companies doing some pretty interesting things, and um, also we get to hear from Josh Burson, Kevin Oakes, um, and um, and Charles Jennings will be there, which will be interesting. So uh, hit me up if you want to uh, attend that event. Um, I can help you get there if you need to. So um, just let me know. And uh, I'll get you there. That's just coming up in a few weeks. But then, of course, there's TLDC 18 coming up in January as well. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce to you all today our guest. Hello, Cheryl. Hello. (laughs) Wait, we need good sound effects. (laughs) Make me feel warm and loved. (laughs) <laughs> That's right. See, you know, Anthony doesn't like my sound effects, but uh, you know, it just it, it just hey. feel good listening to it. So, yeah. so welcome. How are you doing? Very good. Awesome. 
you know, you've been uh, you've been hanging out with us for a while, so you know the drill. You know how TLD chat rolls. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, why don't you give everybody just a quick update? on who you are what you do and um uh what else um yeah that'll work (laughs) well probably like most everybody that's i listen to i was um really excited to hear marty meekum the other day and um i feel honored i guess to be in the same week as will (laughs) thalheimer i'm very excited to hear him um but like i said like most everybody on here i've been doing this a very 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 long time and i started off as an instructional designer and probably i don't know five six years ago i decided to change my name my title to a performance solution specialist because i really wanted to focus on the performance aspect of things and not just from and you know at that time electronic performance support was really big it still is but um, knowledge management i'm focus far more on a far broader um, toolkit than just using those for performance support. And since the beginning, I think I've always been interested in creating this culture of learning at work. And I, I was under some illusion, like many of us, I guess, probably 15, 20 years ago, that that's what other people were interested in doing too. And have been a little bit disillusioned throughout the years that um, that wasn't exactly their goal. And I've I've spent the last many years trying to figure out exactly where I'm disconnecting with them and and why, you know, it's like, I, you know, I have the greatest thing since sliced bread. You know, why why isn't everybody just all excited and jumping up and down to to do this? And so which has led me to do and I love research. I love doing a lot of research. So I've done a tremendous amount of research into figuring out exactly what it is. Don't have the answers yet, but I certainly am much closer than I was many years ago to um, better understanding organizations, what their needs are, why some of them will embrace training or learning or whatever you want to call it, and others just see it as um, a budget item. A necessary evil. Yes. So that's kind of where my um, my program, my uh, in the last, well, about two years ago, I told my husband, I said, I am not going to take on any additional um, instructional design work um, because I really wanted to focus. I'd been building this course, if I want to call it that, a program for a couple of years. And, you know, when you have to work full time and do what you like on the side, it doesn't always <laughs> materialize as quickly as you would like. We all know that feeling. (laughs) (laughs) So I just said, I'm done, you know, Um, I'm done. And I haven't, I've I've done very little instructional design work in the last probably year or two and focused on building my program so that I can hopefully introduce it to organizations and help them build a culture of learning. Fantastic. Well, you know what, let's just uh, jump right into it and uh, get into this whole idea of a culture of learning. Let me go ahead. How would, uh, yeah, of course. So how do we define a culture of learning? Wow, let's start there. I'm sure it's more than what you people can write in the chat, but if anybody has some interesting comments of theirs as far as defining a culture of learning, go ahead and hit that up in the chat. But how do you define it, Cheryl? Um. First of all, I would kind of like to, even if it takes a few minutes of silence here, to hear more what the audience has to say, because part of my research is always asking other people, you know, what, how would you define it? When you think of a culture of learning, what comes to your mind? Yeah, and I am absolutely open to uh, dead air until somebody gives us a definition. That's your cue, people in the chat. Go ahead and uh, tell us what you think of when you think of a culture of learning. And yes, it's okay. We accept snarkiness, but come on, let's try to be a little bit serious today. <laughs> I like snarkiness. Yes, snar- snarky can be fun, but that's what takes us off the rails. Mm-hmm. And we're trying really hard to keep our conversations very focused. <laughs> All right, Craig, thank you, my friend. How the company feels about training, you would not believe how different our ideas of what they need and want are from the people on the line. Okay, perfect. Ubiquitous and serendipitous. 
Too many big words, Marco. <laughs> You're out. That's my gong show gong. It's not a very good one. All right, Dana. Thanks. Oh, I missed somebody too. <laughs> hey, Trish. Good to see you too. Encouraging learning as an important part of work and growth. Excellent. What comes to mind is people feeling comfortable enough to explore other options and taking time to form a plan, uh, not being competitive and not being afraid of things that aren't ultra efficient. Excellent. <laughs> Tom says it takes injecting some idealism into the left brain of the C-suite. Interesting idea there, Tom. Thank you. I did get your email, by the way. I'll uh, I'll get back to you, and we'll schedule some time. <laughs> ah, good point, Dana. All right, let's put a star next to that one, and we'll come back to that. I'm absolutely certain we'll uh, we'll run down that path. She says I don't think it has anything to do with training at all. I think you're right. I think, um, and I think you know, pretty much everything that's been said here is accurate. And um, like Trish said, in, in, encouraging learning as an important part of work and growth. It's been interesting because as I've gone down this path and tried myself to define it, as I'm trying to build marketing materials for my class, you know, I'm, I'm going through all of these exercises of how would you define a culture of learning? How would you explain it in your elevator pitch in, you know, <laughs> three right. sentences or less? And I'm like, wow, I don't know. If I can't do it, how do I expect them to be able to do it? Yeah, that's yeah. always the toughest thing, right? Is um, what's the famous quote? I don't remember who said it, but if you, uh, you know, somebody said if you if you can't explain things simply, you don't know it well enough. And mm. that's always a frustrating quote for me because I'm always like, I feel like I really know this stuff like super well, but I'm just having a hard time putting it into fewer words. You know, I agree, and I think this concept is so big and so broad that people don't latch on to it. It's, you know, it's like trying to grab a cloud. You just, it's like, it's big, it's beautiful. It, you know, does all kinds of wonderful things. It produces rain. It protects you from the sun sometimes. It has all kinds of um, purposes, but you just can't wrap your arms around it and hold on to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's very nebulous for sure. For sure. So what else do we have here? Transparency of business needs, integrity, and give employees tools to grow in their role. Oh, that's mm -hmm. the first time tools have come up. All right. Excellent point, Josh. Thank you for adding that. I like tools. About keeping promises. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I am um, on my journey down this path. It's, it's been interesting to see, especially in the last several years, how the culture at work in general is, cha is changing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't want to go down the whole millennial route and, you know, <laughs> bash millennials or anything. But they have introduced a, a new and interesting way of looking at work. And they've brought with them a whole new set of challenges, you know. And I'm sure mm -hmm. every generation that ever entered the workforce brought with them their set of challenges. So, um this idea that people come to the table or to, I should say, a job today with a certain skill set and a certain mindset, not just a skill set, but a mindset, um, and that that's not going to change even in the next year or two. It, it's just in the world we live in, things change so rapidly that I don't think you can expect people to come to work for you and in a couple of years not almost need a whole new tool set, you know, more tools, you know, different mindset, different way of thinking, different way of looking at things. So we can't just constantly keep sending them back to school because that would take them out of the workplace. It would cost, can you imagine the student debt load on that one? <laughs> so you right. can't keep, keep doing that. So I've personally, and a lot of what you're going to hear me talk about today, I'll preface all of it with is based on my research and my opinions and my ideas. There's no right or wrong answers here. Is that the workplace, and I've written a whole thing on my LinkedIn, um, on LinkedIn, I've written several articles on this, that the workplace is the new educational institution. And that um, in businesses that are going to thrive, 
in the world today are going to thrive because they embrace the idea that they are responsible for their employees' growth and development. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, um, it's definitely changing significantly, and which is one of the reasons why I think it's a very um, both – both frustrating and exciting time to be in our industry and do what we do because everything is changing so much. And this idea of a, um, a culture of learning, I think is difficult for many to fit into their idea, right? The, the box of what um, employment means, right? What it means mm -hmm. to to have employees, what it means to be an employee, and what those rules and expectations are, right? There's a lot of um, HR conversations that need to be had that we still struggle with from an L&D perspective. And it's, um, it's those connections that I think are very difficult for folks because we often... Um, uh, I say we, I put me into the we because I've gone through this before too, but um, uh, you'll hear people in our industry talk about, you know, mobile learning, for example, is always my favorite, right? Everybody says, it's so easy. You can do it. We've got these great tools. Mobile learning is great. There's no reason why we can't be pushing stuff to the mobile devices. We rarely, if ever, talk about the fact that in so many cases, uh, we just assume that people are as excited about learning as we are and that they're interested in learning 24-7, <laughs> wherever they are, any time of the week, right? And in uh -huh. so many workforces, there's actually laws and rules around what you can and cannot do related to work when you're not at work. Uh -huh. So for the expectations to be, oh, this is so great, we're going to do mobile learning because now people can learn everywhere and that's the new expectation. It's kind of like, whoa, you got to pull back the brakes just because the tech allows us to do it and just because we're excited to do it because we know they're out using YouTube and learning everything mm -hmm. else on YouTube and all that kind of stuff doesn't mean that they're going to be able to, even if they wanted to, right, learn mm -hmm. outside of work, right? They may not have access to the VPN to get into the work content. They, And it may just not be legally the right thing to do. They don't want to, maybe they don't want to pay them more money to learn. And so they just say, okay, fine. I'm not going to learn what you want me to learn. I'm just going to go learn what I want to learn right outside of the workforce. So there's, there's a lot of these cultural issues that I think we struggle with in general. Right. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've run into this stuff before in your research. Definitely. And you know, that everything you listed there has come up. I am um, one of you know, one of the questions there in the in the chat is is one of what's one of the biggest obstacles that people have to creating this culture of learning? And there's you you guys have mentioned several of them on the chat here in kindly slightly different um, words. But the first one that I have found to be a, a, a huge obstacle, believe it or not, and rather than tell it tell you, I'm going to ask you this because I've this is totally anecdotal. I go around and ask people this all the time, and um, just kind of gather everybody's opinions. But if yeah. you were to say, if you were to go ask a high school student, what a, a very successful, you know, A plus student that was going to go to Harvard, Yale, whatever, you know, your Ivy League schools, what is it that you feel has made you successful in high school? What, is, what has helped you be successful? What helps you get all those A's that you get, you know, what yeah. would you think they would say? Let's in the chat there, go ahead and share just what you think the most common response would be. <laughs> yeah. Teachers, yeah and teachers that took a minute to have a one-on-one. -on -one. Mark says engagement. Josh says inspiring instructors. Craig says a good test good teacher. Test teacher. <laughs> uh, Dana I says love that one. Village. <laughs> yeah, good. A supportive community. Parental oversight, question mark. <laughs> a lot of times, yes, I would absolutely have to agree with that. Mark says engagement. Um, Molly says family support and self-efficacy. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, and all of those are important. But when you ask the student what helped them learn to get good grades, um, 
I'm amazed when you ask the student themselves, almost every single time they will tell you that they learned to give the teacher what the teacher wanted. It wasn't about learning. It wasn't about um, experimenting and exploring. And so one of the biggest obstacles I found as these you know, students have moved into the workforce, and, and I mean, it, it, it's even part of, I'm sorry, I'm a baby boomer right on the borderline there. But you know, it was yeah. even still part of, that's the way it was when I was in high school. Yeah. It's not like this is a generational thing. And we're not taught to explore. We're not taught to experiment and to fail. And, you know, it's like college, there's a whole host of reasons college came about, and this is just one very small part, I'm sure, came about because employers wanted students or people to fail on somebody else's dime before they got to them <laughs> so that it, you know, wasn't part of the business and the business didn't lose money. Or whether, you know, you had a job somewhere else and, you know, it, it have all those experiences somewhere else so that you've learned before you get to where I'm at, you know, here working, rather than embracing a culture of ex exploration and experimentation. And students aren't learning to explore and experiment because if they fail, they then their grades reflect that. And if their grades reflect that, then they don't get into these Ivy League schools. And if they don't get into these Ivy League schools, then they don't get a good job. And our whole culture is conditioned to believe that failure is a bad thing. And yeah. oddly enough, in the two years I've been putting this program together, that's one aspect I left out of this program to help organizations learn to develop this culture of learning is the aspect of helping organizations learn how to embrace failure. And everybody's like, well, don't say the word failure. It has a negative connotation and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, no, I want to say the word failure. I want it to shock people. I want it to have a shock value because yeah. I want organizations to to stop and challenge the way they think and challenge um, the way they are encouraging their employees to go about their day-to-day -day activities. They are so conditioned to want to do everything right so I don't get in trouble with the boss and I don't make any mistakes and I can climb the ladder of success. And yeah. um, well, it's, me, it, it, it continues to just feed that idea uh -huh. of needing to please the leader right mm -hmm. i mean you when uh, it, it, this is what you get and i hear this all the time when i'm listening to podcasts from uh, entrepreneurs and um, investors and uh, venture capitalists mm -hmm. and all all that right they hate for the most part i, I shouldn't mm -hmm. say hate that's a very strong word mm -hmm. but um they very much dislike getting the academic uh successful academic students mm -hmm. because they 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 come into the mix wanting you to tell them everything that they need to do and instead of just doing it instead of just working hard they want it to just mm -hmm. they want you to just say what is what is the formula that you need for us to win and then tell me how to do it and then i'll go mm -hmm. execute on it right and we learned that going all through school because mm -hmm. you just if you want to get an a if you want to succeed if you want to be the best in the class best in the school go to the best college all you have to do really is please the teacher and give them what they want and go for it and so mm -hmm. you get conditioned do that that's what you're going to get when you go out into the workforce and um that rarely and i know there's research that equates to this that rarely equates to success in business success in startups you know they may succeed um themselves right that doesn't mean those people are aren't successful in life um but they don't become the the geniuses and the the leaders and the gurus that everybody had had such high hopes for it's always this scrappy hardworking, uh you know person that was always crushed by the leadership right and stepped on by the teachers and told they were stupid and told they couldn't do anything and you know with just sheer moxie they proved everybody wrong and and just had that sort of that desire and that itch to get out there and just make it happen and they're not afraid to fail to your point right those are the people that are that have failed their whole life so they got nothing to lose they get it they're like i don't you know i don't care what you tell me i can and can't do i'm gonna do it anyways I, you know if i need to learn something i'm gonna go learn it and make it happen 
yeah, and I'm, I'm really appreciating the comments here, you know. Um, let me scroll back down a little bit here because someone asked a question that I thought was good. Uh, oh, my research. The, 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 it's all my own, and it's just very anecdotal just in my conversations with people. I've never really um, documented a lot of it. But, um, yeah, I, it's interesting. I, and I always tell people this story. I, I grew up in a family of very high achievers. And um, my brother, you know, was my brothers were on the football team, the basketball team, you know, and they were the starting quarterback and the starting, you know, five on the basketball team. And they won state championships in wrestling and they were very smart and they were on the honor roll all the time. And and I certainly had the ability to be smart. <laughs> I just didn't have the desire to be smart, I guess, or really super, you know, overachiever like they were. And um, through no fault of my parents <laughs> or anybody else, I, you know, I didn't get great grades in school and I didn't go to college right out of high school. And it took me a year or two before I decided to go back. And um, oddly enough, when I did go back, I was a straight A college student, but it was at a very small community college that really did embrace. And I think that's kind of where it all started with me was, you know, wow, these people are really encouraging me to do things and they don't care. You know, they're not talking about grades. They're talking about work on this project, do this. You know, we want you to go down to the, um, in Wyoming, the legislature only meets in January because it's such a small state. You know, go down there and listen to what they're doing, what's going on, you know, come back and talk to us about the problems and how we can solve them. And I was like, wow, this is what school's like. I love school now, you know, it was awesome. But it's been really interesting because as I've gone throughout my life, I, I've experienced this failure time and time again. Um, and I've tried many things that haven't worked out. Yeah. And I was just at a family reunion this last weekend with my, one of my brothers and I was sitting down and he's got his son who is into riding motorcycles and they sent him to this camp. I mean, he's been riding for years and, and they sent him to this camp and they taught him all these new and different ways of riding. And he came back and everybody expected that as soon as he's first race, he was going to be like, he was going to win everything. Right. And he's like, this is his words. He says, he sucked, man. He <laughs> lost. He was like in last place. He says, and I called that sports psychologist up and I said, what in the world? You know, cause there was a sports psychologist at this camp. What in the world? And he said, no, that's exactly what we expected to happen. Yep. And my brother's like, we paid you all this money. What is going on here? You know? And he's like, no, when you're learning to do something all over again, he's nobody taught him how to ride motorcycles. Just, you know, you as a dad or grandpa. Yep. Now he's learning from the pros and he's had to unlearn all of the things that he learned and learn. And I do a lot of sports psychology too. And um, so he, that's why he was pulling me aside. Like, what's going on? Is this sports psychologist right? And I'm like, he's 100% right. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know, the advice I gave him, and he was like, I don't think I can do this. You know, I'm not used to this. This is not the way I operated growing up, you know. Yeah. I said, what I want you to do is I want you to take, you know, your grandson here. And as you go to a motorcycle race for the next year, I don't want him to compete against anyone else. He's only 14 years old. Oh, geez. He's got plenty of time ahead of himself. I said, let him go compete against himself every week. To where all he's there to do is evaluate, did I improve on the skills that I learned in this camp while I was performing? He's like, I can't do that. I can't go lose all these races. And I'm like, yes, he can. And if you really want him to improve, that's what you have to do. You have to let go. Yep. Yep. It, it's a fantastic point. And I, I, um, you know, there, there are all of these voices in my head uh -huh. uh, wanting to play devil's advocate uh, as well. Go for it. <laughs> you know, because, <laughs> Go for it. Because I think, it, you know, but, but I mean, I don't know. So there, there are those moments and there are those people, I think, that maybe never got a chance to go to a camp, right? Never got a chance uh -huh. to go listen to the way it should be done. And then they built their careers and became fantastic at what they do merely because uh -huh. they didn't know the rules. They didn't know the, the right way uh -huh. to do it. And so they just did what came naturally to them. And it ended up either changing the sport altogether or just making uh -huh. them, uh, you know, one of the, uh -huh. you know, 
one of the the best in in that sport, right? And I think um, you know, I think that's always a tough it's um it's a really tough spot to be in, I think. You know, people it, my kids are swimmers, so that mm -hmm. I have a whole bunch of uh, you know, analogies from that world as well, but you know, mm -hmm. you have to be tall. You have to be this. You have to be that. And then I can't even mm -hmm. remember the girl's name, but um, one of the last, it wasn't the last Olympics, but it was the one before that. I guess it was two Olympics ago. Uh, the lady that won the gold in uh, one of the breaststroke events, I think, or the medley was the shortest swimmer out there, you know, she was, and, and yeah. shorter than most swimmers. And she's just had... Mm -hmm. And, and even the, the announcers were saying the coaches and everyone can't figure out how she goes so fast. Nobody really knows. <laughs> they, they just let her go. They just let her do her thing. Right. So, you know, it's so hard. Yeah. And, you know, you look at all of these different people and, and the way they approach whatever they're doing. And to me, I, I, we live in such a world where we're conditioned to believe there's a right and a wrong and a black and a white to everything. And, you know, I've also told this story lots and I'm sure all of you have experienced this because I know you all on here are very um, creative and very innovative. And um, as a consultant, people hire me and they, you know, they look at my resume and they're like, whoa, we are so impressed. Come in, you know, and we want you to work for us and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, you've, you've got gaming and simulation and you've created all these really innovative kind of learning experiences. And then they sit me down at a computer and say, here's Captivate. Here's our storyboard. You know, go for it. And I'm like, are you serious? This is really why you hired me? You know, I. Yeah. As a consultant, I pay people to build that stuff and captivate. I don't, that's not what I do. It's a skill set I have, but it's not what I do. <laughs> right. And, and I'm sure in the workplace, that's one of the biggest obstacles too, is not only do we not embrace this, you know, experimentation, exploration kind of culture, but we also, whenever we do get somebody that's creative or innovative or thinks differently, we, I, and I keep, it's not just that they put me at a computer in front of Captivate. It's that they really try to shut down that creative side. It's like, no, 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 no. That will, we have a process for that. Yeah. You know, it's going to mess up the process. Right, right, right. You well, know? Whatever, whatever you do, don't, don't mess up the process. Hey, listen, we're at the halfway mark. We're going to pick mm -hmm. up this conversation. I'm going to uh, uh, jump back to a screen share real fast and just say, um, I can see what I'm doing here. I can just say thank you to the community. Thank you, everybody, for uh, hanging out uh, with us today and to let you know about our uh, the rest of our week, actually. Um, tomorrow is open forum, so we're, we're wide open for conversations tomorrow. But then on Thursday, we are chatting with the wonderful and fabulous Will Tallheimer, as Cheryl mentioned earlier. And we're very, very excited to have him as always. He is uh, an, an outstanding uh, friend and guest. And uh, and that'll be a good time. And then, of course, we have Video Friday. Uh, Sam will be back. I think we, we missed him last Friday. Uh, yeah, we that's right. We dipped into some virtual reality stuff last Friday. But uh, Sam will be back, and we will be back to Video Friday as always. But, again, I just wanted to say thanks to everybody for hanging out and being a part of the TLDC community and sharing it with your friends. That's always the best part. I've seen a couple uh, uh, new names and avatars uh, hop into the chat today. So appreciate that. Anytime you guys can share what we're doing here at TLDC, we sure do appreciate it. And uh, it, it lets us know that we're doing something right as we continue to grow and uh, speaking of growing, we've uh, implemented a, uh, um, a membership plan as well. So TLD chat will always be free. So don't ever worry about that. There is no, um, no fee. I know I've run into some folks who say, how do I get signed up for TLD chat? And I say, you don't, you just show up. Um, and it's, uh, it's a bit shocking to most people, but TLD chat will always be free the hour we meet here every day, but we are beginning to create other valuable resources for the community and helping everybody again, do the work of training and learning and development and be successful, grow in your careers 
and get the things done that you need to get done. And we're going to help you do that in any way possible that we can. So we have um, part of our membership. Uh, Tom Adams is here. So I'll, I'll just give a quick shout out. He and I are chatting about uh, him being our first for one of our particular uh, membership uh, benefits, which is basically owning a whole TLD chat for yourself. What is it that you want to do? Uh, what are you working on? What do you want to learn? We will focus on you and your specific needs, your specific work goals, whatever you want to talk about. You can use this collective brain trust and um, you can craft the questions. You guide the conversation. Uh, the TLD chat is yours. And uh, it, with with uh, what Tom's currently working on, we may have to break it up into multiple TLD chats for him, but it's a fantastic uh, challenge and um, really, really, really looking forward to having that conversation and, um, and uh, allowing everybody to learn from his experiences. So uh, really looking forward to that. And um, I know Craig's starting a new gig, so he's going to... Uh, um, uh, have lots of experiences to share. Another friend of mine that's been in the TLD chat before um, started a new uh, a new gig as a global learning leader, and she's uh, cranking up that department. So that's going to be fun to uh, hear about her experiences and to be able to share it. So um, just another fantastic benefit. Um, obviously, you can just show up here every day and you can ask whatever questions you want to the community. But uh, we want to formalize that a little bit for those folks who really decide to go that extra mile and pay the, you know, 75 cents a day or, you know, whatever it is that it, it boils down to, right? 15 bucks a month comes out to about 75 bucks, a sh 75 bucks, 75 cents ish, uh, under a dollar, uh, a show. Uh, so for one hour, less than a buck, um, right, right? We think it's, um, well worth the value. We hope everybody's getting at least that much value. Uh, and hopefully more. So very excited about that and um, looking forward to being able to continue offer more and more and more value to, uh, to our members and the community. So, uh, so thanks everybody. And um, it is uh, fantastic to have you here today and uh, special thanks and special shout out to Luis for putting up with me and uh, for Craig for taking notes on the days that he can and Kara for doing some uh, fabulous, fabulous uh, work on the social side and filling in for Craig when he's gone and just being a, a huge help going the, the uh, above and beyond the extra miles. So uh, those folks who um, take an active role in helping us produce and, and uh, do TLD chat, we really, really do appreciate you all. So um, with that, I will get back to our conversation with Cheryl and we'll jump back into the uh, the question pool here as well, just to make sure we hit them all up because we got about 20 minutes left. So um, I think we've actually hit a little bit on each of these, but um, maybe these shorter ones we can just hit up real quick. Craig asks, how would you start a culture of learning for a company that has never had a training department? So I think that's an interesting question. And since it's been voted up, let's just go with that so you're starting from scratch you're in an organization um i guess my part b question to that would be is it even possible from the chair of learning and development or the, the training department to help create that culture well this is an interesting segue it works out perfect since we're shamelessly promoting all of tldc um, that's actually what we're going to discuss at our pre-conference. So, Luis, if you have the link, we, um, Brett and I were looking for it earlier. I won't tell you the big long story why I'm not touching my computer right, <laughs> right now. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's working great, by the way, so don't touch it. Yeah, two hours of failure got me here, okay? <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, that's what we're going to talk about um, at our pre-conference workshop at TLDC. And I encourage you and to come. I This is not going to be, I've tried, maybe you can help me. Help me find another word. It's not a course. It's not a program. It's not a, you know, I don't know. Um, I want it to be a discussion. 
and we will have um, a prescriptive element to it that kind of helps you walk through a process where you can start to create this culture of learning. It almost to me falls more under organizational development. That's usually where these kind of things are housed. But because it has such a strong training and learning component to it, I just don't think, I think they both need to come together. Yeah. And that's a lot of what we'll talk about. Um, and I, honestly, I think a company who's never had a training department before is probably better positioned to do this than someone who has. I was reading an article on LinkedIn. Um, Linda.com has this whole culture of learning section. And so I follow them pretty religiously. But um, they said that one of the, um, it was interesting to me, they ask you know, what is one of the obstacles you have to creating this culture of learning? And they said the fact that L&D is so, I don't, this isn't grammatically correct. It's not a department that is respected within an organization. And they show the statistics. And I, I was going to bring that link and put it here, but we won't go into my long story about that, <laughs> why I can't do that. But um I, it just flabbergasted me. I thought, I mean, I've always known this. It's kind of what we talked about at the beginning. Yeah. That the C-suite just does not value what we do. So if you've got an organization that's open to um, doing this, then, and doesn't have a training department, I say all the better. Because it's kind of like, you know, Brent said, when we're talking about you know, we can teach people how to do things correctly, or we can just kind of let people experiment and explore and try. And if if we're not so prescriptive and we allow that culture to um, be nurtured in a way that is unique to that organization, then I think it will be valued. I think what we keep trying to do in training and development, especially on the training, if I want to use those my air quotes, training side, is prescribe things and tell people how to do things. And what's your initial reaction when someone tries to tell you how to do something? Don't, don't, yeah, don't, I don't, I don't want to do it. Yeah. But if you let me explore and give me opportunities to open up and then people are, they embrace it and they say, okay, yeah. So I would think my own personal opinion again, is that it would be more challenging to get into, you know, the big Fortune 50, Fortune 100 companies and say, hey, we're going to change your culture of learning. And as a matter of fact, when I go out and promote my, my program, my course, whatever you want to call it, I target small companies who don't have training departments. Yeah, it's almost like you have to, um, to a certain extent, because what we're talking about isn't just... You know, to your point, uh, you know, right, it, what we do is um, is connected to so many other departments, like you were saying, right? I know org dev yeah. people, um, they have to interact and do, you know, training and learning is a big part of their thing. Mm -hmm. You know, HR in general uh, is, you know, part of what we do. We've got to connect with IT, right? IT is creating new stuff, so they have to train people all the time, right? Everything that we do is is connected and somebody, every department has a responsibility of some sort to deliver or to do learning or training um, on something, right? And so then you get this HR generalist style solution of, oh, we have a training department under HR, they're gonna handle everything, but then they never can staff it or resource it enough to get all of the work and all of the requests done. So then we get stuck in this real cycle of, well, that's why we're not respected because we're not doing all of the things that they want. Mm -hmm. We don't tie ourselves to the business. And, you know, and then it, and because we get so obsessed about just doing the training right as we see it, right? Mm -hmm. As we see what training, as what we think as an industry, you know, good training should be as opposed to looking at it from the point of the business. And I know we talk about this all the time. We drive this point, at least I try to drive this point as hard as I can by having folks like Marco on and Ajay and others who beat this drum, right? Connecting to the business is critical. And so how do we connect a culture of learning to 
the business. It's got to be connected to the business and everybody has to see uh, the value of it. And I think approaching it from that standpoint, um, you know, might be one of the, the ways that we can make this happen, but I'm not exactly sure. I just noticed Katie's comment. I have a template for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. We have a template for everything. And yeah, um, we were looking for that link. Actually, Brent and I were I'm going back to Craig's comment. He was like, they need the link to the registration page for this. Um, we couldn't find it. So I was wondering if Luis was on here, if he could. Yeah, I, don't, uh, I thought I saw Luis on earlier, but mm -hmm. maybe not. Is there, have we created a page yet, Luis? If we did, if there's a link, I could Yeah, find there's it a page. On website. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, whatever. Yeah, oh, it, it might be on the, on the registration side of things, but uh, pop that link in there so people can uh, see what we're doing. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I lost my train of thought here, which isn't hard for me to do. I'm easily distracted. Um, well, the culture of learning and it being mm -hmm. needing being tied to the business, right? Needing, needing yeah. to get everybody on board with the business objectives and then giving people the ability to say, hey, I need in order, you know, instead of in like what you were saying earlier, right? Like pushing content onto people is traditionally what we do. This is the right way. This is what we should do it. You know, the best approach that's ever, you know, that I learned and enjoyed the most going up through the ranks and in my corporate career has been leadership or managers that say, these are our goals and objectives. These are the things that we're trying to accomplish. We're not married to how we do them. We just know we need to get here. This is where we are. This is where we need those numbers to be or where we need the mm -hmm. sales to be or where we need, you know, all of the business things that, that, that business people are concerned about. The, the best ones have come to me and my department and said, help us. We don't care how you do it. We mm -hmm. just know that you're a part of this puzzle and a part of this solution. You tell us what needs to happen. And this is where everything falls apart and goes off the rails. And and I'll and then I'll I'll, I'll end my rant uh, at this <laughs> point. But this is traditionally where we would stand up and go, well, according to Kirkpatrick and blah 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 blah, learning is a very important part of everything. And we go into the science and we go into all this stuff. And they, you know, the nice ones don't cut you off. They let you go through the whole thing. And at the end of it, they say. That's fantastic. Thanks for that hour lecture on uh, instructional design theories and what you're going to do for us. But uh, what are you going to produce at the end of the day? And how much is it going to cost us? And is it going to be valuable to the business? And, and yeah. we never really have an answer for that. No, we don't. And I think, um, you know, to Katie's point, you know, we need to know the backstory. I'm also a storyteller. I'm, I really like um, the, this case study you know, method of evaluation, because I, and I even think the C-suite, they like stories, they like things they can relate to. And even if the, the evidence is somewhat anecdotal, if you can back it up, you know, with a few numbers here and there that are accurate and that resonate with them, I think that's where, and we talk about that a lot in, in the program that I offer too, about, you know, how do you, because it really is about we, we can have a template, we can have a prescription for this to some degree, but on the flip side, we also have to make it very personal and very something that resonates with people. I'm working on a project right now, oddly enough, it's because a lady that I worked with, she was the chief learning officer at Sodexo in 2006 and she retired. She came back and asked me to work on this project. So I agreed to work as the instructional designer. Oh. Um, and it's really interesting to me because she, you know, she has some very specific business objectives that she's been tasked with creating are learning to support this business objectives. They need to, um, it's a, a, a rehabilitation center for older people or people who've been severely injured. And then they rehabilitate them and then they make these decisions about, you know, do we put them back at home? Do we put them in short-term care facilities? So anyway, they need to um, bring the readmission rate back under 20% so that people that they put out there are really are ready to be out 
on their own again and not constantly being readmitted. So that's a very tangible number. I was like, okay, we can deal with this. Yeah. So we're we're creating this video and we're going back and forth with the subject matter experts and they're making this whole video. All of the script is very technical. It's very, you know, and it's about a meeting that we're trying to teach these people how how do you make these decisions and you're conducting a meeting with with a group of people. And it just is so amazing to me because they um the patient is part of the meeting, but the script that they wrote is they're talking about the patient as if the patient isn't even there. And these are simple things. These are very simple things. I'm like, we need to change that script to make it inclusive, to make it welcoming and warm. And we need to get rid of all this technical and clinical language and just start having a conversation. And I cannot tell you how much pushback we're getting in that. They have a whole nother course that they offer on coaching and mentoring and using warm and welcoming language. I'm like, you're promoting it over here, but over here in this course, you're not modeling it. You're not demonstrating it. That's part yeah. of a culture of learning is, is making sure that everything you're doing is, is, is feeding up to that goal. Well, you, you know? got to embed it into the workflow, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what we always talk about too, right? How do we get learning as close to the point of need as possible yeah. and mm -hmm. as, as part of the workflow, right? Um, mm -hmm. there are tools that you can use to do that, right? But they're not mm -hmm. training tools, right? The, the traditional way is pull people away from their job, typically mm -hmm. as far away as you can possibly get, <laughs> the oddest thing, put mm -hmm. them in a strange environment like a classroom or a conference center in a hotel and, um, you know, and, and then try to teach them about how to be, uh, you know, how to have empathy for the patients and how to be nice and how to ask great questions and how to be mm -hmm. delightful when you're greeting people and things <laughs> like that, right? You know, shouldn't you, you know, have people be practicing that and being having that ability to um, to coach somebody live, right? Uh, you know, or as, as close to live as you possibly can, right? In, in situations like that, maybe you can't um, you know, be, be absolutely in front of them a hundred percent of the time. But, um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're getting there. This is the part that gets exciting for me. I'll, this will be my only shout out. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I, I, uh, I, I joined EdCast is that they're doing some very, very, very cool things, uh, in these areas that at least give us a fighting chance to, to allow people to be coached. Uh, at really close to the workflow using mobile devices and, um, you know, doing things differently than just pulling people out for courses. And so it's, um, it's, it's fun to see. It's fun to know that the technology has finally caught up with what we've been, all been asking for and mm -hmm. knowing that, okay, now we can start pulling this off. But now, of course, there's all the other 500 hurdles of uh, uh, getting people to buy into it and to understand and to change the culture of learning, right, from that training mm -hmm. mindset to a, mm -hmm. uh, a mindset of lifelong learning is not easy. But um, hopefully the more we can have folks like you on TLD Chat and, uh, and, yeah. and spreading the gospel of the culture <laughs> of learning, we can get further along. Yeah. I agree. And the other along that line also is if you go to my LinkedIn profile, um, I've created a LinkedIn group called, you know, creating a culture of learning because it is such a broad topic that's hard to get your, you know, hands around and, and grab. And everybody has a different perspective and, and everybody's perspective is valuable. And so if any of you would like to come join that conversation, I would love to have you in there. I truly, I much as I'm able to be on TLD, TLD chat, I, I fully appreciate this community and what you bring. I, I feel like, I don't know, you said the other day something, you know, I finally found my tribe. I found my people. I found my people and I want you all to come join my little group so we can talk about this some more. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, I forgot about that. Thanks for reminding me. So yeah, so hit her up on LinkedIn and, um, uh, let's see. Actually, I'll do it right now since you're not touching your computer. I'm going to find your group. Hold on one second for me. I may already be a member unless this is something you just recently. I think you are a member. Yeah, I do believe. Uh, fired up. Let me just go to my groups then. Oh. 
Yeah, while you're looking at that, it just, um, I think so much of creating this culture of learning is really a, just, it's, it's a change management process and it's about, and that's a big part of the program too that we talk about um, in my program is, you know, change management because that is kind of, you know, we, we, we talk about all the tools, we talk about all of the different um, ideas and philosophies behind it, but then how do you actually implement that? Uh, you know, I'm all, I'm a very, I love theory and I live up in the clouds with my head in the clouds a lot of the times, but I really believe in coming back down to earth and saying, how do we make this practical? How do we make this happen? Um, and I'm hoping, you know, for the people who attend that everybody will walk away with a different solution and that everybody will have a different idea and that, you know, we'll continue to have the conversation once it's over so that we can continue to share our ideas and let them grow and evolve. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you are, um, you know, you know, what you're offering people is extremely valuable and very much needed. And um, I think everybody is struggling with this. Um, there is this shift to digital learning that's occurring mm -hmm. in general in our industry. Companies are trying to figure out what to do with their training departments because they are all starting to realize, you know, that, that something else needs to be done. There are other options. People are finally starting to see all of those other options, both from a technology standpoint, but also just mm -hmm. from a design standpoint and what can be done and what should be done and, you know, how to create business, how to create more business, how to grow businesses, how to scale up a business. Um, all questions that revolve around this culture of learning. It's not just the L&D and the training department that's talking about it. It is, um, I'm hearing it coming up in a lot of other different um, industries and in different circles. Uh, executive leadership is talking about it as much as we like to kind of bash them and say they don't really know what they're talking about and all that. <laughs> I do hear the conversations going on. I do hear them caring. And, um, you know, they're, they're, we wouldn't be able to do what we are currently doing if there wasn't buy-in from executive leadership. So um, I think level setting in that area is important. All right, I am on your LinkedIn page, but I am not seeing the groups that you're at. Of course, I'm not a fantastic LinkedIn user, so. Yeah, um, I'm on my own I profile. Find, and I don't know how to find somebody's groups. I'll just send it as a follow-up if that's okay, because right now I, I got well, brave good, and I went yeah, to a new tab. Uh, yeah, let's put that in the Facebook group. Mm -hmm. We can just, okay. we can add links in the Facebook group. Totally forgot about that. Great, great, great idea. Well, thank you so uh, much, Cheryl. So we've got all those links coming. Um, mm -hmm. Give us the quick sort of, uh, where can people find you and all that good stuff? Well, I'm a LinkedIn person <laughs> more than anything. And um, you can find me on LinkedIn. I write a lot on LinkedIn. And, oh, yes. And if you want to see my website that really as best as I could describes this program for creating a culture of learning. And it's not just about the program, it's just about creating a culture of learning in general. It's smartlearningforbusinesssuccess.com. All one big long word. Smartlearningforbusinesssuccess.com. Mm -hmm. Got it. I know Craig's frantically typing it into the chat right now. There we go. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Thank you, Louis. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Cheryl, thank you so much for hanging out with us today and um, actually getting this conversation around the culture of learning started. I think this is one of the topics that we um, we may have touched on it a few times, but I don't think we've ever really focused on it before. So um, so it's good for us to have one of these sessions, uh, conversations, this topic sort of recorded in the can. Uh, and um, mm -hmm. and ready for us to uh, you know expand the conversation a little bit and riff on it a lot more. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, I would encourage everybody to sign up for her workshop at uh, TLDC if you want to really get down and dirty and and do the work right and make this happen mm -hmm. because that's exactly what TLD Chat is all about. Yes, there will be lots of people there talking about stuff and presenting and giving you information, but the critical element is doing the work. And it doesn't mean you're going to be 
actually getting your hands dirty, but maybe the work is just thinking critically, um, questioning others, having deeper conversations, making deeper connections, um, sketch noting a few ideas out, and maybe um, a book comes out of it, like uh, one did out of TLDC 16. You know, there is um, a lot of work that can be done and a lot of energy that can make magic happen when you have the synergies of a group like this hanging out together. So, um, so I'm absolutely looking forward to that and, and maybe not solving this problem, but helping everybody work through the culture of learning and getting their organizations further down the road. Um, at an event like this is a great place to do that. So thanks again, Cheryl. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thanks for being my tribe and thank you for having this format where we can all share. I really appreciate that. Absolutely. We love it. And it's our pleasure. I'm going to close your video out, but you'll still be logged in and you can, oh, you're not going to touch your computer though. I was going to say you could chat with everyone, but well, since we're, all, <laughs> we're done anyways, just go ahead and touch your computer. If it crashes, you're good. That's true. If, if you don't get a response, you'll know my computer crashed. There you go. There you go. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Cheryl. We'll talk to you later. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for hanging out today. What a fun uh, day. Great conversation. Great topic for us to be considering. Um, as I was closing out there, I was thinking about that. I was like, yeah, wow, we have not talked about uh, the whole, the, the bigger picture, that culture of learning and um, and those types of issues. So again, real quick, just um, uh, tomorrow, open forum, Wednesday don't feel like oh wait i don't know what we're going to talk about so i can probably just skip that day some of the serendipity that occurs on open forum days are some of the best conversations that we have as a community so um so don't skip out on it be surprised yes we can finish our death of flash conversation absolutely How about, <laughs> that's, a, that's a great idea that's a great idea. That's always our backup if we uh, if we if we need to go there. Let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, it's a, it's a good plan. But anyways, again, Thursday is going to be Will Tallheimer. Super excited to have Will Tallheimer uh, on on Thursday. Uh, he's a hoot and uh, a super knowledgeable guy in our industry, and excited to have him on board. And again, of course, Friday video Friday with Sam Rogers is going to be fantastic. So. Um, uh, be sure to hit us up at tldc.us, get registered, and join. Actually become an official member, and um, we will uh, give you all the benefits of, uh, of membership. And um, again, TLD Chat will always stay free in January, January 29th and 30th. Don't forget TLDC 18 in Phoenix. Get registered. Be thinking about it. And also my quick shout out for the Future Learning 2020 Summit coming up in Santa Clara, California. If you're in the Silicon Valley area, it's probably too last minute for many of you to make travel decisions. But if you're in the area um, and you want a quick day and a half shot in the arm of some executives, you want to you know bump elbows with some, uh, some pretty high level execs working on um, uh, L&D stuff, um what a wow i mean what a great place to uh to make that happen so let me know i can get you hooked up and uh it'll all be good and you can talk to toddy too she went last year and she loved it she's going again as well so uh so just let me know i'll get you all connected and, and hooked up and you can just show up um uh if you're in the area you know if you can make the trip so uh, all good stuff. We are super psyched and super grateful for all of you that are a part of this community. Thanks for hanging out with us today. We will be, uh, again, back here tomorrow, probably talking about the death of, uh, of Flash as, uh, as much as we may or may not want to see it go. It's gone, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. Adios, everybody. <laughs> Thank you.